Welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is Episode 79, The Fundamentals of Extended Techniques with Robert Dick, Part 1. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. everyone. So we are back here with Robert Dick. And um, if you have not listened to the audio portion of episode 79, please listen to that because this video will make sense um, as a package. So we are going to start um, with Robert Dick demonstrating uh, harmonics. Okay. So we're basically talking about the embouchure. And you know, again, this is the production side of the playing where logic is the primary um, force or um, and plan. Um, not, um, you know, we're not leaving it up to, you know, well, that's the way I do it. Um, all right. So, okay. So when we're discussing harmonics, we're really talking about the embouchure. And being the production side of flute playing, we're going to make this logical um, and in harmony with the way we're made, the way our bodies are made. So now we know that the lips are very complicated with zillions of muscle groups, but we can simplify this picture when we're thinking about it. So. The first part of the embouchure, the strongest and most mobile part is your jaw. I mean, we all know that once we go from low to high, we're raising the angle of the air. And so you can get more angular change with your jaw than any other way. And you haven't committed any muscular force at all yet. Okay, next are the big muscles at the sides of the embouchure. Okay, now the plan is very simple. The biggest and strongest parts do the most work. And as we gradually move to the center, which is the weakest part, still plenty strong, but compared to the sides, it's it's weaker. the center is going to do the fine work and the fine polishing. Many people do the work in the center and are just relaxing the sides. And the gospel of the relaxed embouchure um, is something that really doesn't hold water logically. Um, It was a reaction to something that happened more than a century ago that has nothing to do with our lives today. And that was the change from wooden flutes to metal flutes. The wooden flutes made, say in 1895, are very different than the wooden flutes made in 2019, which are made to be highly responsive. The old flutes were really resistant and as Jeffrey Gilbert explained to me, because uh, he's one of the people who started on them and made the change, um, <clears throat> he said it was very simple. The harder you squeezed, the clearer they got. Hmm. 
And I own a Ritter's house in Flute from about 1908. And I sometimes use it as a Nautilus machine for my lips. Um, because it's true. I've never, ever found an upper limit. The harder I squeeze, the clearer it gets. Hmm. Um, now, the tone is beautiful, but it's not flexible. It doesn't change. You can just beam it right out. And, you know, and when the French players showed up in England and Germany with their Louis lots, and people were like, oh, my God, listen to that. This fluidity, this flexibility, the colors are changing. Um, okay, we got to do it. Well, what they instantly found was if they used the same embouchure that worked on these, you know, cannon wood flutes, it sounded horrible <laughs> on, 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 on a silver flute, just horrible. Hmm. And it took no time at all to figure out that if they relaxed a bit, it sounded better. I see. So, it worked for them. And so they told their students, relax. Their students told their students, relax. And so, after, you know, five or six or seven generations, and that has passed, and more, you know, you get people playing with barely any compression here at all. Hmm. And... Now, I'm not suggesting we go back and play those old-fashioned wood flutes. You know, they had their day in the sun. Um, but the lion's share of the embouchure work should be with these two, these pairs of muscles here. Mm. And it should feel like you're holding something. Mm. And I often recommend people take kitchen matches and stick them in there. Mm. And squeeze on them. It's a try it out there. It's not crazy. Uh, just don't put the chemical end in your mouth. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and be careful about the toothpicks. No lawsuits. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, and so you'd be amazed at how much more clear it will sound. Hmm. So then, with this support. We can extend the lip tube and get more inner lip surface past the teeth to shape the air. Yes. And the longer the lip tube, the more things you can do with it. Hmm. So now I'm going to do a really super simple pattern. I'm going to start on C natural and just play the first three harmonics. When I get to G, it'll be four harmonics. The idea is we're going to never go above high G. Hmm. At E flat, it's five harmonics. And I will count to six this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> practice this, you get even a lot slower. And now, I'm going to show it from the side. And let me know if you can. If Am I okay? Yes. Okay, so now.
could you do that one more time and turn about 45 degrees towards me? Like this? Yes. So you could see that I was putting the jaw position first, then setting the armature, then blowing. Mm. Now what you couldn't see was, you know, I'm hearing. Before you play it, you will be telling your musical truth. Hmm. And that is what people want to hear. Yes. People don't want to hear a great technique. They assume that you've got it because there you are. People are not there to analyze your double tonguing, they're there to, to hear and experience your musical truth. And that can't happen if hearing is the last thing that happens. It has to be the first. And again, when I realized that I had to make this change, because I was taught the same way, you know, see it, play it, listen. Mm -hmm. I, I did what I could do. I went one note at a time, you know, so, you know, for you folks out there, you know, we all hear stories about people who could free here, you know, minutes into the future. Well, great for them. Um, uh, if those were true. Um, but don't be intimidated. You get to work and you start with what you can do which is one note. And so let's say that you're playing an ultra, ultra exciting, uh, heart-stopping G major scale. Okay. <laughs> so, now, if you're not sure where G is, give it to yourself. There it is. Hi, G. Okay, now... As you play G, can you hear? Oh. As you play A, can you hear? Oh. Ooh. Ooh. And then if you need to change octaves to your voice, G. Oh. need to start at such a basic place than I did mm -hmm. and and I accepted that and got to work nice well I just saw the movie The Alien on TV the other day and you know the guy's closing statement he's been rescued he's back on earth after all these you know incredible things have happened but he just said you know when there are problems you just get to work. I agree. You solve the first one, hmm. then you solve the next one. Hmm. And then you just keep solving them until they're solved. Yes. So, um, so now, now you can see all of that jaw motion and, and like, why am I doing that? <clears throat> because I want to play the flute 
in harmony with the nature of the flute. Now, wind instruments are divided into two kinds. There are impedance instruments that are based on resistance. The clarinet is the avatar of resistance. Well, if you're shopping for a clarinet, you want to buy the one that pushes back at you hardest when it sounds best. Mm. That will be a winner. Now, the flute is the avatar of admittance. The flute is all about flow of the air through the instrument. It's not about resistance. Mm. You know, when you play the flute with a lot of resistance, you get this tight, tight, you know, sphincter-style tone. Makes me clutch in embarrassing places. So, um, now, if you if you think that's beautiful, which you're entitled to, um, that's how you get it. because aesthetics are personal. Um, you know, if you drive a car through the French countryside today and flip on the radio, within minutes you're going to hear somebody saying, Je t'aime. Oui, yes. <laughs> oui. <laughs> <Oui, oui. laughs> yeah, well, they think it's beautiful because they do, and yeah. therefore it is to them. Mm. So, it would drive me nuts. Uh, but now, so if the flute is about getting the air into the flute, through the flute, and out of the flute, then basically the first thing we want to do after we've matched the resonances in the body to the resonances we're going to play with the flute is move the flute to the place where it accepts the air most freely for what we want to do right now. Mm. Uh, and, and so we know that the angle of the air is going up so as we go higher. So now we can play without moving our jaws at all. And there are lots of people who do. gets tighter and tighter. Mm-hmm. So, now, um, and, and so I'm through practice and experimentation, I found where that spot is. good way to do this practice and experimentation is somehow, you know, when you're looking for that spot, that that spot, it's easier to hear when you're using a harmonic sound than the regular flute sound. And if you ask me why, I will tell you I don't know. But I found it to be true. And it seems to work for lots of other people, too. Hmm. So <clears throat> maybe it's just because it's different. Hmm. Uh, but so now, if we're looking for the spot for that C, and now I'm going to, my one and only natural harmonic choice is low C. <laughs> So using the low C fingering, I'm going to go fishing around, and um, it's going to help if I can hear myself better. And you can hear when I wasn't there. Now, an octave higher, we have two harmonic choices, low C and low F. And when you have 
have multiple choices, the jaw position where you can move between them freely is a good spot. Mm -hmm. Now, if your jaw is in too far from there, the flute is going to bark at you every time you change fingering. If you're out too far, the flute is going to squeal at you when you change fingering. yes or no answer for something, you know, I mean, so much is so subjective, but was that a good position or not? It's really good to know, yes, it was, or I got to work on it, you know. Then, um, during compression here, um, also, behind the lip plate, the part you can't see, hmm. there's a little bit of this kind of action. Now, there are general principles that apply to us all, and there are individual tweaks we all make, because we all, we don't have the same face, we don't have the same lips, and we don't have the same image of what is really beautiful that we want to play, mm. you know, so, um, but the, the general principle is to maintain as much contact with the lip plate along its length as you can, you know, and sometimes you see people take the flute away and there's just like this tiny little bit where they've been touching it. And so, like, uh, the embouchure action is miles away from where the sound gets made. Mm. Now, what happens past the lip plate um, depends entirely on your personal facial features. There is no correct and incorrect. For some people, bringing the corners down is natural. For some people, just kind of having them straight is natural. For some people, where they sort of go up in a smile is natural. What your face does is correct. Um, so, you know, I know that you know, my corners tend to go up a bit. Well, that's the way my face is. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <You know. laughs> now, if my face went more like this was natural, well, then that would work much better when I played the flute. Mm. And I had a teacher who tried, to, you know, tried to get me to play the corners down. Mm -hmm. And I worked on it for a while. Yeah. You know. But, you know, it, for me, that feels completely artificial. Okay. Now, and again, if it's natural for you, that's the way to fly. But, um, you know, it's the human face. There's no one size fits all. Right. Um, but the general principle of maintaining as much contact with the lip plate, however, is very wise whatever your lip formation is. Mm. Then, the job, the muscles right under your nose have a job. Wow. Full employment. So, and that is to move your upper lip down so that more of the inner lip surface can shape the air. And we've got to get it past the teeth. Mm -hmm. Now, I have been lucky enough to meet many of the world's great flutists. I mean, there's still a bunch on my bucket list, you know, 
but I've met a lot of them, and I'm not just talking about players of this kind of flute, but Shankuhachi, the Japanese end-blown flute, also the Nokon, which is one of their side-blown flutes, um, you know, the Indian Bonsuri, often played this way, um, the Irish flute, the Traverso, um, you know, pretty much everywhere there are people, there's a flute. Yeah. You know, it's really, and, and it's a fascinating thing to do. You know, spin the globe, stick your finger down, and as long as you're not in the middle of an ocean and you're on land somewhere, then look up the flute playing from wherever that is, because there will be some. Very cool. And, and you can learn from them. Yep. They will have colors that you go, oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. You know? So anyway, in every case. Now, one of the things that also seems to be universal about flute players is people are sitting around telling jokes and laughing. You know, I mean, I must say that as a subset of society, we tend to be more cheerful than some other subsets. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very happy for that. Um, and so now you look at the person's facial features, and they are what they are. Mm -hmm. You know, Hari Prasad Shirasia, for example, um, you know, the distance between the top of his upper lip and his nose is microscopic. Mm. And, and he's one of these guys who has, you know, one of these like eyeliner, pencil thin mustaches. Yeah. Um, and it really does look like it was put on an eyeliner. <laughs> um, oh, Hari, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, so, but it sure makes it easy to see that when he plays the flute, how the distance increases enormously. Mm. Because that's what he's doing. He's getting the inner lip surface past his teeth. So, and so, you know, you can see this again and again. As the flute approaches, and the embouchure starts to form, the lip tube gets longer. Now, air, and students out there, I hope that at every stage of this game, you're saying to yourself, oh, that's cool. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. Because, you know, we're not going to be, you know, telling you false information here. But if you don't understand why, then you're not going to be able to use it to make the next step yourself. Yes. My job as a teacher is to teach you to teach yourself. Yep. So now, air is a gas and brought to focus slow, excuse me, brought to focus gradually, it will stay in focus after you release it. Mm. That's what some genius, why some genius invented the nozzle. And in a certain way, our embouchure is like one of the ultimate nozzles on the planet. I mean, talk about adjustable in you know, 97 ways. Uh, and so by bringing the air to focus more gradually, Now, uh, most of the college students and high school students out there, when you begin your teaching career, are going to be little kids. Yep. Most well, remind it was pretty much for everybody. And very often, you'll find their cute little embouchures pasted on their teeth. And they make a sound like this. And um, and you want to help them turn that sound into something more like this. And so, you know, the mantra is kiss the sound. Hmm. Don't bite it. Hmm. Let the oboe players bite. Well, yeah. We are going to kiss the sound. And it really is a kind of kissing motion. Hmm. 
And um, Ron Paul had this wonderful habit. Um, you know, he would finish a movement, play the last note, and take the flute away, but not release his embouchure for this little split second. Huh. So you'd see him go like, smart flute students in the audience were going <laughs> right at that moment. Yeah. Going home and trying it out in their mirror. Hmm. Um, so, now, all of this kind of mobility is developed through practice. Mm -hmm. The strength, I mean, we only discussed the starting point of harmonics, um, um, but Every flute player should reasonably be able to play low B up to high B. Mm -hmm. That's eight harmonics. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so here we go. I'm, I'm going to back away because my computer microphone is not, not going to like this. Um, you're going to die, and where the sound actually has some clarity to it, then you can say, okay, I'm, 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 I'm getting up to speak with you. Mm. Um, because the things we will be doing, like multiphonic, do simply take a stronger overture. Yes. And, um, and so, and you'll find that even if you don't play multiphonics, if you do the throat tuning and practice harmonics, people are going to start saying, um, what is it you've been doing lately? <laughs> it really sounds better. Hmm. Um, so, um, so I don't know if we have enough for an episode or whether we should move on to some microtones and glissandi. Yeah, I think microtones um, and the glissandi were going to still be a part of episode 79, if that's okay for you. Or we can um, extend them into episode 80, whatever you would like to do. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering if this isn't um, enough to fill people's brains up right now. Yeah. No, that's a good stopping point. Okay. Yeah. So, so thank you all for listening and watching, and I hope... You'll try this stuff out, um, and um, and think about the big dream. You know, to really imagine, you know, playing at the level that the greats of all music play, not at the level that you hear the flute playing being played around you. Mm. And you know, as all those country music people say. You can never shoot your foot off aiming at the sky. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dick, and I appreciate your time, energy, and talents, and um, the listeners are just going to be blown away by the wealth of information that you provided. Well, my privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 Podcast. For more information, 
please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.